So hi everyone, welcome to the final CSE Development Economics webinar of term. I'm just going to go over some of the ground rules um, before we start. Um, so the, the speaker is going to have 45 minutes uh, to, to give their presentation. And during this time, we ask that you restrict yourselves just to asking clarifying questions. Then in the final 13 minutes, we will have a more general discussion and, and Q&A, and then you can ask all your sort of broader questions uh, rather than just the clarifying ones. Um, so I'm really um, excited to, to welcome today Anne Curring from Princeton University or soon uh, University of Chicago, uh, who's going to be presenting to us uh, the social multiplier from visibility, experimental evidence from deworming in Kenya. Um, so welcome um, to the CSE uh, webinar and, and over to you, Anne. So thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for zooming in today. I realize it's the last seminar before the summer, some people might already be on break, so this is great. So um, I'm presenting work today that is joined with Kareem Nagib. Um, Kareem unfortunately can't join today uh, since he is um, at work uh, in the US as well, but uh, feel free to, you know, leave any questions um, in the chat and uh, Emma, I think, will monitor them for me. Otherwise, um, I'll be taking questions if you raise your hands, from what I understand. So um, this paper is... Um, motivated by the fact that individuals um, care about how they're perceived by others and they might actually take um, they might take visible and costly actions in order to influence others perceptions of them. There's a myriad of empirical evidence that we have at this point from recent field experiments that shows that social image concerns can meaningfully impact behavior in domains such as decisions to vote, um, making charitable contributions or even students um, decisions to make efforts on tests. However, um, there's a lack of evidence on how we can harness these social image concerns um, to promote um, contributions to public goods. And secondly, and this is a, the main part of this paper, we actually understand very little about how the effects of these signals or signaling incentives and visibility might vary at different levels of art participation or put differently at different levels of equilibrium take up. Secondly, um, this paper is motivated um, by the empirical observation that there is a range of public health problems that require timely, voluntary and collective action. We are currently living through one of them, which is the global pandemic that requires voluntary actions um, in various domains from people to comply with um, COVID safety protocols. There's other examples such as efforts to eradicate polio or a third example, which this paper is going to be focusing on, is the challenge of uh, stopping the transmission of worm infections. So according to the WHO, there are globally 2 billion people that are infected with soil transmitted helmets. helmets. We do have a medical solution to that that's readily available at a low cost, which is deworming treatment. And deworming treatment is not only having health benefits, but it's proven to be a highly cost-effective way to also increase other outcomes we care about when thinking about development, such as school attendance, as shown by Michael Kramer and co-authors. So why should we um, care about this from as, as economists, sort of? So from a social planner point of view, um, we would always want there to be a higher take-up of deworming treatment since there are large externalities from uh, taking deworming treatment. And I'll show you a bit more in a moment about this, but people generally lack an understanding about these externalities, but they agree in general that deworming treatment is the right thing to do. So you and I should take deworming treatment. Lastly, to mention deworming decisions are currently imperfectly observable. So taking these observations together, we're asking in this paper, can we increase the participation in deworming treatment by allowing individuals to show to others that they're dewormed? And we're going to implement this experiment at a large scale with the government of Kenya. And so we're also asking how feasible is the implementation of such signaling incentives at scale. Secondly, in more general, this paper is trying to understand how do honor and stigma concerns, <clears throat> meaning reputational payoffs change as the, le the level of participation in deworming might change, specifically as the cost of participating in a certain pro-social action might change. So we're looking in this paper at whether social signals and introducing visibility can actually mitigate or might lead to an amplification of the impacts that changes in cost or benefits of a certain post-social activity might have on participation. And 
we're trying to actually quantify that as well. So we're trying to see how large are these social multiplier effects. And I'll define in a moment exactly what we mean by social multiplier. I think most of you in the audience are familiar with physical multipliers and the object will look sort of similar about what we care here. So what are we doing in this paper in order to answer these questions? Um, so let me walk through this. So the first thing is um, we need to introduce a, a signal in order for individuals to be able to actually learn about the actions that other people in the environment may have taken, and then subsequently to attach types to specific signals that they're observing. So in this research, we're making health behavior visible by allowing individuals to show that they're taking up deworming treatment through a colorful bracelet or ink on their thumb. Ink, ink is something that's uh, commonly used in contexts like Kenya uh, in voting in order to make sure that people can't vote twice. The second challenge is that normally um, levels of participation are not random, uh, whether a community is high in their take up of a specific treatment or participating in a certain activity, but they're endogenous. So what we're doing in this paper, we're trying to exogenously vary actually the take up at the community level for deworming treatment by randomizing the walking distance that individuals have to take in order to come to the locations where deworming treatment is available to them. And this will be crucial in order for us to actually say something about these potential social multiplier effects that can occur in the presence of visibility. Thirdly, for a signal to be meaningful, or visibility in general of behavior to be in, in used as a signal, it is important that everyone understands what the signal means. So we need to create common knowledge in the unit of treatment. Our context is not that of an individual, but we're implementing this experiment at a large scale, 144 treatment locations and their catchment areas. We randomized into different incentive treatments in this experiment. It was an experiment that was implemented across 12 days and we targeted roughly 200,000 adults that we um, were eligible to come for deworming treatment. Fourthly and importantly, um, the context we're looking at here is actually quite similar to that we're facing currently in the pandemic with the coronavirus vaccine in the sense that it is not an established activity that adults would come for deworming treatment. So we were concerned about whether there might actually be social image concerns, whether a person is taking up deworming treatment an adult or not. So what we're doing is we're implementing a public information campaign, emphasizing the public good aspect of deworming and the preventative nature of the treatment. And lastly, one of the main challenges when trying to say something meaningful about social image concerns or social signaling is there's a host of alternative theories that could be at play and influence behavior as we're introducing visibility. So what we're doing in this paper, but I won't really show today, so you just have to believe me, we're having an additional treatment, which was an SMS treatment, where we saturated people with reminders and also information about take up of other people in their community in order to control for alternative theories about reminders or social learning that could be going on as one person comes to deworming on day two, another person observes them and henceforth is influenced actually by having observed the other person to go on the next day for deworming, since this is dynamic setup. Lastly as well, importantly to mention, I'm gonna talk about this in this paper, we were concerned about uh, bracelets, for example, also conferring a consumption utility or generally speaking by introducing an incentive for people to take up treatment, to being normatively influenced as they might infer from that the desirability of the action or the importance of the action. So in this paper, not only are we going to introduce two signaling incentives, but we're also going to have a private incentive that was made available for people if they were to come and take up deworming treatment. So a quick preview of the results. What I'm going to show you on this paper is that individuals use the bracelet and ink signals to learn about others' deworming decisions. They value the opportunity to signal, which shows that participation rates in deworming treatment increased from 33 to 42% for the bracelet signal. So this is one of the important learnings we take away from this paper. Not all signals are the same. For the ink signal, we actually um, observed slightly negative impacts, which we attribute to its messiness, but also that the signal was distrusted due to its link to voting. So we may not be able to easily use a signal that works in one domain and apply it to another domain just because it is a familiar technology to make behavior visible. Thirdly, um, speaking to the social multiplier effects that we're interested in, 
um, an increase in the cost of deworming um, as measured by the mean walking distance that people have to take to take up deworming treatment of about one kilometer leads to a doubling of the treatment effects of the signaling incentives. And what we learned from this, we're going to put a bit more structure on this problem to meaning to actually correctly estimate these social multiplier effects, but social signals mitigate the responses or can mitigate the response to an increase in cost at the levels of take up where we, where we are. And it's roughly between six to 7.5 percentage points per kilometer at which the signaling incentives were able to mitigate the negative impact that an increased walking distance would normally have on the take up of deworming treatment. So we're estimating a social multiplier that's below one. So now a quick overview. I'm gonna give you a little bit more information about the empirical context before I'm gonna to introduce to you briefly the theoretical framework, which was the motivation for the design of this experiment, but also for the survey data we collected. Then I'm going to tell you about the different treatments or generally the experimental design, briefly show you the reduced form results, and then we're going to add some more structure to this problem in order to properly identify separately social signaling effects from effects that might be due to private utility, but also in order to estimate these social multiplier effects and really take uh, advantage of all the data that we've collected in one modeling framework. So in terms of the empirical context, um, for people not familiar with it, so soil transmitted uh, helmets, these are intestinal worms um, that infect humans and they are transmitted primarily or they're transmitted through contaminated soil. They constitute a development burden for children and adults in many low income countries. Um, the majority of people, adults, have actually um, mild infections that are asymptomatic. So if you and I had worms, we may not even know that we have worms. More severe infections, however, lead to abdominal pain, iron deficiency, anemia, malnutrition, and stunting. And primarily children are impacted when they have worms in their cognitive and also physical development. So the way I want you to think about this um, in this paper in terms of the decision to take up deworming treatment is really like the decision to participate or contribute to a public good. Since for most individuals, the private returns to taking up treatment are really low and the majority of benefits are really in terms of externalities are social benefits, since they're going to contribute to reduced disease transmission. So, People in this audience might be familiar that um, there is a large literature, even in economics, or like multiple papers that are talking about deworming treatment. Just to be clear, um, across various countries right now, in an African context or an Asian context, there exists a school-based deworming program where children are basically regularly dewormed in schools. What this paper is trying to do was a joint effort with evidence actions and researchers at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene was trying to figure out logistically how can we get adults to take up deworming treatment in a very short amount of time in order to lower the reservoir of worms that adults carry with them, which continuously leads to reinfection of children. So medically speaking, they're still trying to figure out where sort of the herd immunity of threshold is of how many adults need to get um, dewormed or like how lower we need to get infections. But this paper is really about if we have that objective, how can we even practically make that feasible through what type of incentive structures? And then lastly to mention on is that any of us right now could take deworming treatment. Um, it's perfectly safe, even if you don't have worms, to take deworming treatment. And also the cost of screening is about four to 10 times uh, that of um, actually taking treatment. So the WHO recommends everyone just blanket to take deworming treatment in areas where infection rates are high. So in Western Kenya, where this experiment is implemented, infection prevalence is over 20%. Um, as I said, um, the school-based deworming program is a well-established and known program for children. Um, and adults, however, uh, most frequently get access to deworming drugs if they were to purchase them for pharmacies or clinics at a cost of about 150 Kenyan shillings, which is 1.5 US dollars. Just to give you a little bit more information in terms of how we should think about this, um, this technology of deworming treatment being known or even used by adults, before we did this intervention. So in the baseline survey, we found that 78% of adults knew about deworming treatment. This is self-reported data, but 68% reported that they had taken deworming treatment before. 37% <clears throat> reported to have dewormed in the past 12 months. So you can already see from those numbers, they're way too low. Everyone is meant to uh, deworm in these areas every 12 months or so even six months in certain areas. And only 31% of adults had knowledge or an understanding of externalities, meaning that the, their decision to deworm or the decision of others to deworm could impact their health or they could impact other people's health. 
Can Lastly, one more piece. Quickly, yes, please. Uh, with two clarifying questions. Um, yes. so one is you said, I think it's 20% in Kenya, the incidence of worms, but is it different in um, the study areas you're working in in particular? And also, could you comment on the transmission of worms, particularly from adults to children? Uh, sorry, the first question is if there's heterogeneity in the in the infection prevalence. Uh, sorry, in, yeah, in the exactly. infection prevalence. Or, or what is the prevalence in your study areas? This is the uh, sorry the the t uh, over twenty percent is the um, is the infection prevalence in our study area. Um, however, on a more fine grained level, as I show you, because we're working uh, across three countries, um, not countries, counties, um, we're currently trying to get access to the data from Camry uh, to actually do our own um, estimations on that and also to say something about to what extent we may have reduced that. So I can't really say more on that right now. Uh, secondly, when thinking about uh, the transmission um, from adults to children, uh, one of the challenging problems is uh, sanitation is generally poor. So open defecation can still happen um, through adults as well. And then uh, children playing uh, outside, playing in the soil might get transmitted, might basically get infected by these worms. Um, while we know and we've seen in, in the US or other countries where worms were previously prevalent, they were basically eradicated through massive improvements in sanitation. This is not something at least under current um, forecast that is gonna be achievable in the next 10 to 20 years. So we're really relying on deworming treatment and it seems a more cost-effective way forward to push for a blanket treatment and take up as opposed to hoping that everyone's gonna get access to the kind of hygiene conditions they should have access to or have that. Okay, so then uh, one last piece of information to give you um, since this, um, since this research is really about social image concerns, we asked at baseline, how people would judge others um, if they were to take um, deworming treatment or they were to decide not to take deworming treatment and we benchmarked these, um, these answers to other known familiar health behaviors such as the decision to immunize or not immunize your child or the decision to use a latrine or openly defecate. And we had uh, one, one, uh, one, answer, uh, one question which we considered as the placebo, which was wearing or not wearing nice clothes to church. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, this is sort of the answers on whether you would praise the person, um, even, for, even for wearing nice clothes to church, you would be praised. But we can see that basically the kudos that is given to per people if they were to uh, participate in these health behaviors is higher for immunization and using a latrine and it's similar um, deworming is basically on par with these two other known health behaviors. When flipping to the right hand side and you're looking at um, stigma concerns, the way it was phrased in the survey was whether you would look down on a person. You can clearly say that there's, for example, a no real, uh, like limited judgment conferred to someone who's not wearing nice clothes to church, which was meant to be the placebo treatment on top. So 75% of people would say they would not do that. However, when looking at the decision, uh, if you were to not immunize your child or openly defecate, more than 75% of people would say they would look down on you. And very similar to that, looks, uh, the answers looked when looking at uh, the decision to not participate basically in deworming treatment that was offered to the community, where we're around um, just around uh, 70% in terms of looking down on you. Now, let me dive into um, the, uh, the theoretical framework. So the theoretical framework is really meant to provide um, a foundation of how we designed the experiment and the subsequent survey data we collected and how we're going to go about estimating the effects. Um, what I'm going to be doing in the following is directly take the empirical context and map it or map the theory into the empirical context of the, of the decision-making problem, basically. So we're gonna be working with um, a theory that um, on post-social behavior and social signaling by Bunebo and Chuol in two of their papers, one from 2006, and a second one maybe less known from 2012 called Laws and Norms. So on top, I'm showing you uh, an individual's utility function, which we are generally broadly thinking about constituting of two terms. The first term is going to be the net private benefits that an individual receives from participating, which is the action Y, deworming or not deworming basically in this activity. And um, there's also going to be a cost term, which is going what we're thinking about here in, in this scenario is basically walking uh, to the deworming uh, treatment location. Importantly, individual heterogeneity in this model is coming from uh, the term V which we're thinking about as the intrinsic motivation that individuals have to look after their own health and the health of others. V is an unobservable latent variable, so others do not know your type, your post-social type, but you know your own post-social type. And that is going to determine how, generally assuming people with a higher post-social type are going to benefit more in terms of private benefits from taking up this treatment.
Then the second term, importantly, in this decision making um, from an individual's perspective is going to be um, the expectations that others, so that's why it's negative I, might form about your type conditional on the action they're observing, meaning whether you dewormed or did not deworm. So here, uh, the important part is there is a mu parameter. So the mu parameter is giving us a sense how much people care about these potential expectations or inferences that others form. And mu is the combined of the probability that others might observe your actions. So this is something we can experimentally manipulate. And lambda, which is generally the social image concerns that people might have regarding this behavior or being judged or honored by other people in their community. So when thinking about um, what is happening in equilibrium, basically equilibrium in this kind of context is pinned down by um, a cutoff type, which is a person who's just indifferent between taking up deworming treatment or not. So anyone, and then the reputational return. So what you see on top here, this equation is basically um, an implicit function. We're solving for a fixed point here and the two components. The first one is the private benefit and the second one is the net reputational incentive. So just to be clear, it's pinned down by a person who's indifferent between taking up the deworming and not taking up deworming. So anyone who is a higher type than that cutoff type would take up deworming treatment and anyone who is of a lower post-social type would decide not to take up deworming treatment. An important term in here, which I'd like you to pay attention to, is the next line, which is this delta V star, which is the net, net reputational incentives. And in this, in this context, what we assume is the way we think about this is there's on the one hand, people can potentially ob could observe that you did not take up the action. So the expectations they would form about your type conditional on not taking up the actions, which is the later term, potential stigma conferred to you, or the expectations they would um, form about your type conditional on taking up the actions. So the difference between these two average type expectations is going to be what is sort of the benefit you're receiving um, from having taken up the action as others can observe it. So both of these are conditional expectations that are increasing in V, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about the functional form of these reputational returns in a moment. Uh, the last equation you see, so assuming there was no visibility, let's assume mu is zero. So you see this below, uh, B, Y, uh, basically taking up deworming treatment, but um, it being V till uh, Tilda, I think I'm, I'm terrible, sorry, with, with little um, annotations, but the key point is in the absence of visibility, um, the, the cutoff type in this instance would be higher, meaning um, that fewer people would take up the decision uh, to take up deworming treatment that is assumed if there's no visibility. So just to, just to show you this um, graphically, um, we're going to assume generally uh, in this paper, right? I mean, we tried other permutations, but we're gonna assume for simplicity um, that post-social types are normally distributed. Um, so you, you have an example here of um, a type distribution. So as we're moving from a world with, uh, without signaling to a world with signaling as we're increasing visibility, what you can see in this, in this image is that the cutoff type is shifting to the left as more individuals decide to take up deworming treatment. Now, anything um, that I just um, said to you so far is basically, um, you could imagine to observe these kind of effects with a regular consumption of financial incentive. However, there is something particular that we, we may try to understand as we're starting to work with uh, social signaling incentives and introducing visibility in certain behaviors. And what we're interested here specifically is um, as we are increasing um, the so increasing the costs or the benefits to specific actions, how might that actually impact um, overall take up behavior? So the object we're interested in is the average take up behavior um, indicated here as y bar as a function of the cost of deworming. As I've already said, what we're considering here is uh, walking to the deworming location. And specifically, the sensitivity here would be basically the derivative of this average level of deworming take up with respect to cost. And as you can see in the, in the last equation, so I don't have a pointer, so I basically want you to pay attention to the second equation you're seeing is the first object is just basically the probability, uh, uh, the PDF, which is just the derivative of the cumulative um, distribution function. But then the second object, which is newly coming in here, is going to be referred to as the social multiplier. So if you pay attention to the denominator of that term, what you see is there is a derivative of um, this delta that I've showed you before, the reputational returns, with respect to, v, uh, to C, basically the cost change. So 
generally speaking, what's going to happen is normally when we're increasing the cost of a specific behavior, naturally some people would not come because the benefits would no longer be sufficiently high in order for them to take this action cost. However, the second thing that's going to happen in that context is we're actually changing the cutoff type meaning the person who would normally be indifferent between coming and not coming. And changing the cutoff type in the scenario of thinking about social signals is going to also change the reputational returns, meaning this delta V term. Basically, as we're shifting the cutoff person, the reputational returns will shift. This is this derivative um, at the uh, at the in the denominator that you see here, and the prediction really that this paper is making that we're trying to take to the uh, to the data here is that when you're looking at the lower level, you're getting the stark prediction from a model with social signaling where if a lot of people are taking up the behavior, so meaning you would have a really low V star, you go all the way to the left in the in the in the in the graph below. It's very respectable acts. So there might be high stigma concerns if you're not contributing or if you're not participating in a certain um, in a certain behavior. However, if very few people are taking up the action, then actually um, this might be a more admirable act because the costs are much higher and honor is more sort of prevalently what's conferred to you. So as you see, there is sort of a U shape in terms of the reputational returns. And what that means is that in, in, in the area of respectable X, for example, people could be more sensitive to changes in costs and benefits. So they could actually be amplifying, social signaling uh, motives could amplify changes in costs and benefits. Whereas in the other domain, it could be um, with admirable X that people are less sensitive to changes in costs and benefits. So um, social signaling concerns might actually mitigate the impacts that an introduction of a tax or even a subsidy, any kind of price, um, price instrument we would be using could have on change in behavior. So this is really the key object we're interested here and, and hoping to, to tease out with our experimental design. Now, let me, um, Emma, if you could tell me how much time I have, that would be really great. I'm trying to look at my, my clock, but I can't really figure it out. So just so I have a sense. You have about 18 minutes. Okay, I need to run. Great. So let me tell you quickly about the, the context. I've already told you a lot. We're doing this basically in the context of Kenya. We're working with um, the government in Kenya. And this was implemented, uh, not by researchers, this was implemented by community health volunteers. So community health volunteers across 12 days provided free deworming treatment across 144 locations, Monday to Sunday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And importantly, not only did these community health volunteers provide um, deworming treatment to local communities, but they also implemented an information campaign prior to the start of this deworming treatment. So people would be informed ex ante about the availability of deworming treatment, the dates, the location, but also they had knowledge about what incentives would be available to them, basically what they would be receiving as an incentive or reward if they came for treatment. And we also really uh, paid attention if people have uh, worries here about how people think about making deworming behavior visible, we really emphasize that it's just like take, uh, using a mosquito net or washing your hands, that it's basically a preventative behavior. So the two main experimental treatments that we introduced was on the one hand, um, an incentive treatment, where we had two different types of signals, as I already said, a bracelet and an indelible ink. So the bracelet um, could have some private utility, but certainly increases the visibility of your actions. The ink we thought um, has no private utility of anything potentially slightly negative private utility and also should amplify the visibility of actions. We also introduced a private incentive in order to, it was meant to sort of mimic the private consumption utility you might get from the bracelets. So we took a small wall calendar, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. And we assumed that while that calendar might allow you to signal to yourself, because you see it on the wall, and just to be clear, people in, in the context of in Kenya, they have lots of calendars on the wall. It's kind of like a decoration, not like us, just one calendar, that it might self-signal to you, but it certainly should have a much lower visibility to anyone in public. And the second, and then there was obviously a control group where people just came for deworming treatment, but they weren't receiving any incentive. And our second treatment then broadly was a cost treatment where we manipulated randomly how far people had to walk in order to receive this treatment. So here you see an image of the bracelets. Um, they were green and it said on them in Swahili, treat worms, improve the health of your community. 
This is an image of the calendars that people were given. This was implemented at the end of 2016. So they were given war calendars that set 2017. They did not have any reference to evidence action or to deworming or anything, which is actually where people complained about in the end line, that it didn't say anything about that it was for deworming treatment. So to show you um, the, the design of the experiment was um, we stratified this across three different counties, Kagamega, Siaya, and Busia County. So treatment locations were randomly assigned to be either far or close, and then a randomly chosen community there would either be, sorry, the, and then the treatment locations were randomized into one of the three incentives, either ink, calendar, or bracelet, or into a control group. So just to give you an idea, this is the map of the area we're working in. Uh, these are the different colors of the three different counties. And here you see 144 treatment locations with a circle around them, which is the area um, uh, where the community uh, would be located in where we collected data that either had to walk a far or a close distance in order to access uh, deworming treatment. And um, these site selection, we generally did this outside schools. Um, this is really random whether you had to walk far or close because as you can see from this map, these are GPS coordinates of primary schools in Kenya. They are available like sand on the beach. There's tons of primary schools in the area in Kenya um, where we could have set up uh, deworming treatment locations. Here I'm just showing you lastly how the uh, distance assignment was done uh, by the incentive treatment. So the red distribution is showing you the um, how communities were assigned to a close distance and the blue one to far. So generally communities who were between um, who were assigned to close had to walk between zero and 1.25 kilometers. And communities who were assigned to a far distance had to walk between 1.25 and 2.5 kilometers. So on average, the distance in walking was one kilometer since it was between uh, 0.8 kilometers and on average 1.8 kilometers that people had to walk when they were far located. Now, let me briefly show you the reduced form results uh, before putting a little bit more structure and uh, putting more data on beliefs and other things uh, into this estimation. So what we did is we um, estimated treatment effects through a hierarchical probit model, which allowed us to introduce random effects, um, random slope effects at the county level, and uh, random intercept effects actually at the village level. So I'm just going to show you here um, the main treatment effects um, from the different incentive treatments. So this is, I'm going to be showing you the results over and over again in this sort of form. So let me briefly explain it. On the right hand side, you can see, sorry, on the left hand side, on the left hand side, you can see the three incentives, which are bracelet, calendar and ink. And every single, every time they're compared to the control group. And then you see in the shaded area and the light shaded area in gray, these are the prior predicted treatment effects since we're running, um, we're using a Bayesian estimation. So they're nicely centered on zero. And then you see in the darker areas, you basically see the actual estimated, uh, the posteriors by using the data, the average, um, uh, the average treatment effects for each of the incentive treatments. So the upper panel is showing you combined for all treatment locations, ignoring distance, what the effect of these incentives was on deworming take up. As you can see, um, the bracelet in this instance had the largest effect of increasing uh, take up by about eight percentage points. Calendar had, you know, a slight positive effect of around increasing uh, take up by three percentage points. And ink actually had mostly negative effects, or really had a negative effect of around uh, three percentage points. So now, interestingly, when looking at how do these effects uh, play out by separating far and close communities, we can, if you first pay attention to the calendar, what you can see is for the calendar treatment, treatment effects did not really vary by distance. So regardless of whether individuals had to walk a far or close distance, the private incentive equally incentivized people or increased take up. However, the bracelets and also for the uh, ink incentive, we can see that treatment effects uh, increase by a lot. Um, I mean, less negative for ink, but for bracelets actually increased more than doubled when uh, looking at individuals who uh, were located far away from the deworming locations uh, compared to individuals who were close to the deworming locations. So increasing from five to over 11 percentage points and for the ink um, from about negative five percentage points for close communities moving to about zero, so no negative effect. I think Kate is raising their hands, but uh, Emma, I leave it to you. I'm just seeing it. So one last point I want you to take away from the reduced form is that 
as I said, an important part here was really the uh, randomization of communities into different take up equilibria. So what I'm showing you here is um, the actual take up levels. So I just want you to pay attention to looking at the control in the, for close locations. So take up was about 40% for control communities who had to walk uh, less than a, you know, around a 0.8 kilometers to the treatment. When, however, increasing um, the distance by one kilometer, what you can see looking at the control for far communities, treat, um, take up decreased by around uh, 15 percentage points. So as we know from the health literature, but distance really has an important effect, but this is also what we sort of wanted and needed in order to actually look at how might the uh, visibility change subsequently the incentive effects as we are in different levels of take up equilibria. So now let me jump. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm also getting into the last section. So the, uh, just to be simplistic on the, the first slide, um, yes. I just wanted to understand how we should think about uh, whether the different effects are significantly different from each other. Um, yeah. So um, a little confused about that. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Um, um, I actually, Kate, I don't know the answer right now between the bracelet and the uh, the bracelet uh, from the reduced form, I don't know from the top of my head whether we're significant um, at what level. I need to check. I can tell you that these confidence intervals will shrink as we're feeding in data on beliefs and actual valuation of private valuation of these incentives in the model. So I primarily show you these effects before, this is me, my co-author doesn't like this, but I want to show you the reduced form before I go to the structural so you can see they really look the same. And then I'm going to be able to use more data to get more precise estimates. I'm going to shrink these confidence intervals and they're going to be significantly different. I can't tell you what at which level they are and I should be able to tell you. I will write it down. Thanks. But yes, the point is to think about them, um, really what this is about is that they need to be, I mean, they should be significant, not should, but interestingly would be if they are significantly different. So um, now what we're doing here is we're essentially taking the theoretical model as I've shown it to you at the beginning, we're taking it, um, we're coding it up as it is into a statistical model. So the only two changes that we're making to be clear is so I'm showing you again up here, the decision to take up deworming treatment or the average, the average level or the take up level is gonna be a function of um, Z, which is going to be the incentives that we randomly assigned and then D, which is the distance. And the difference components that we're considering here is again, the private benefit, which we changed by providing different incentives, but also by changing the distance. Then the next component is going to be, uh, which we can identify or pin down, is basically this reputational returns payoff, where the one difference, the one change that we're making compared to the theoretical model, as you can see, we're considering mu not only to be a function of z, which is the incentives, which varied visibility, but we're also allowing for mu to be a function of d, meaning that potentially salience or um, visibility, perceived importance of certain behaviors could vary across distance. And then the other part that we're changing in the statistical model, we're allowing for a second margin of heterogeneity. Not only is it the case that we would assume, you know, people might differ in their type, but there might also be random cost or preference shocks that could occur that basically um, make the inference slightly weaker about your type as your child just may have fallen sick or you may have gotten other opportunities when it comes to your work or various things could have happened. Um, so um, this is just to give you some intuition what would essentially happening as we are allowing for an additional random shock to enter this inference problem. So as we're allowing for random cost or preference shocks like this U term. So what is going to happen here, um, I'm plotting you again these net reputational returns. So the upper dark line that you're seeing is sort of the U shape I've shown you before on how these reputational returns are expected to vary across different take up levels. And then the lines below are just showing you as we're allowing the, um, the variance basically to increase the standard deviation of these random shock terms, how that is going to affect the reputational turn of uh, payoffs basically um, related to the inference of type. So as you can see, obviously, the more noisy the inference problem is, the lower these reputational returns will be, but also not only are they going down, but they're also flattening out. So the more other noise that is going on, the, the weaker basically um, these mitigation or amplification effects uh, would turn out. And we didn't want to like pin it, we didn't want to determine anything there. We wanted to be agnostic and just basically allow for this kind of additional noise to enter our estimation. So now, uh, given that I'm running out of time, just let me know, let me show you the additional data that we collected that we're going to be using when estimating these effects again. 
um, in a statistical model, but then also when trying to estimate the social multiplier. So there's two more additional components that were relevant to us, which is um, we needed to actually pin down how does the private utility that individuals receive from the bracelet compare to the private utility of the calendar? Since we made generally the assumption they should be the same, but we didn't really know. So what we did is we implemented a willingness to pay exercise at the end of this experiment in the control group, where we offered individuals to basically either at the end of the survey, get a bracelet or get a calendar. And then we gave them a random amount of money and said, you know, would you be willing to give up what you first chose uh, if you were to get the other item plus this amount of money? So this allows us to price out the utility difference that people uh, have between the calendar and the bracelets, which is really what we're interested in. So what we can see from that, generally speaking, people had a strong preference. If you look at the upper panel for uh, bracelets, uh, sorry, for calendars, 75% of people chose a calendar as their first choice. And then as we offered to them between zero to 100 Kenyan shillings, so one US dollar, basically they were willing to flip. If you, I gave you a full dollar, anyone who previously chose a bracelet would definitely take a calendar. For um, the other way around, it's not quite the case. 25% of people would still stick with the calendar if they were offered a dollar and to take the bracelet. So the utility difference between these two consumption items is roughly 45 Kenyan shillings. So if you were to just do a plain comparison like I did in the reduced form, we would actually overestimate or we would underestimate potentially the signaling benefits conferred from the bracelet since they did have a lower private utility um, component than the calendars. A second part that's really important to us is, as I said, we want to um, look more closely at um, the visit. What we're interested in here is how visibility varied across these different treatments. And so we collected first and second order beliefs. So meaning at end line, we asked individuals, about 10 other people in their community, whether they knew that they came for deworming treatment and whether they thought that they knew that they came for deworming treatment. So I'm talking very fast, but basically it's first and second order beliefs that we're trying to elicit at end line. So what I'm showing you here is the results from both of them. And since we're running out of time, the only thing I'd like you to pay attention to is just focus on the first order beliefs. And you can focus on the right upper graph or image, which is the treatment effects. And what we can see here, interestingly, that uh, for the calendar treatment, again, we're separating it by far and close, we really see no difference in terms of first order beliefs, the information that people had about others' decision to come for deworming treatment. So the private incentive was similar to the control in terms of information content. But when looking at the two signaling treatments, we see strong increases in the information that people had, particularly for far communities. So this is the orange treatment effects you see. Um, going up by about uh, 14 percentage points, 18 percentage points increase in first order beliefs uh, for FAR communities for these two signaling incentives. So now, um, lastly, Emma, I have like two more minutes, I think. Good, let me run. So um, what I'm going to do is, so I'm just going to show you as we're putting this together in our structural estimation, um, if you just eyeball and believe me that basically I'm showing you the incentive average treatment effects here again, they look very, very similar. So there's really no magic or difference that we're achieving with our structural model, which we also didn't want. But now what we can do with the structural model, we can basically cleanly dis uh, separate out private versus uh, social, um, sorry, treatment effects from signaling effects versus treatment effects from private incentive. And what we find is that actually the calendar, same as before, as you see, very small treatment effects, however, mild ones, even from signaling, since there was some visibility, as we've seen in the first and second order beliefs, even for calendars or control. But importantly, for ink and bracelet, and not significantly different here, they both had positive impacts when it comes to uh, the signaling effects. And as you can see, again, um, at far, far communities, these are much larger. The reason why um, ink overall had a negative impact is really what we, what, we, what we show is that there was a large private disutility from that. Now, I won't be able to speak clearly to this, whether this was related to the, due to the messiness, which is something we should be concerned about because people also get it for voting, or because um, the next year there were elections in Kenya and people generally were, uh, might be distrustful by us using a signal that's normally used for voting in a different domain for health. Now, last, last result, and then I'm going to be done. Um, I just want to show you essentially this multiplier result where we were interested. I'm plotting on the x-axis, showing you the distance to treatment locations, showing you all communities being lined up at different distances to treatment locations. And I'm showing you on the y-axis the take-up probability, comparing the control group to the bracelet group. And what you can already see here is 
you see generally, as you would expect, a decline in demand as we're increasing the cost for distance. But what you can see is there is a less deep decline in the demand for the bracelets compared to the control group. What we're doing now, however, why we need more structure is what we actually need to do to estimate the social multiplier object. We need to hold the equilibrium, the cutoff type constant, meaning we're needing to have the private utility in the bracelet group to be the same as the private utility as in the control group. That's what we can do with the structural model. So we can actually estimate the slope points. We're basically estimating many, many different um, par partial derivatives to kind of see what would be the impact of increasing costs at these different cutoff equilibrium points at um, the average take up, which is based the social multiplier object. So how does how does uh, average take up respond to these cost increases? And as you can see here clearly from the control and plotting you the bracelet group is that while at the control group um, we're about um, starting off if we're looking at 0 0.5 kilometers, we would have a decline about 13 percentage points in take up of deworming treatment in response to a one kilometer increase in cost. For the bracelet, this would only be a decline of roughly uh, seven percentage points in, D in take up if we were to increase the cost by one kilometer. So we can really see this difference and it's roughly between um, six and uh, 7.5 percentage points by which we, um, these social signaling incentives or visibility was able to mitigate the impacts uh, that an increase in cost has for deworming treatment. So to conclude this, we show in this paper um, so to signals building on existing norms are viable mechanisms to increase contributions to public goods. Braces in this context are the most effective signals. So what we need to be careful about is generally what type of signals we use and whether we can use known signals to just transfer them to a different domain. And lastly, consistent with theory, reputational returns increase actually at lower equilibrium take up levels. And the increase in reputational returns could mitigate, for example, negative, uh, the negative impacts of higher costs. Why is this important from a policy perspective? If we have to decide where to put up treatment locations or vaccination centers or any availability of services um, that have a public good character, we might be able to um, set them further apart, basically cover with the same number of treatment locations a larger geographic area if these reputational returns can actually mitigate some of the negative cost impacts that would otherwise happen. Thank you so much. I ran over time. Thank you so much for bearing with me. No, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation, and uh, you only ran over like one minute, so, so it was very good on the time. I also speed talked, so I'm yeah. not sure how much was kept in the seat in the questions in a moment, and certainly... Uh, no, well, thank you so much for, for covering so much material. So, um, yeah, we'll go straight into the Q&A now. Um, so the first question that I see, and, and please raise your hands if you have questions, is from Annette John. So I'll just um, allow you to talk, Annette, if you want to say your question. Yeah. Um, hi, Anne. A really fascinating. Hey, nice to see you again. <laughs> really fascinating and uh, important work. Thanks so much for this. And um, so I'm not sure whether this is a clarification question or a discussion question, depending on how trivial you think this is. Probably trivial. Um, doesn't signal? Doesn't your signal? signaling intervention have negative externalities on the people who are already getting the warm. So if I understood your model, your visibility treatments move down the cutoff value of V, which means that those above that cutoff to begin with are now getting fewer social Im Im uh, image benefits because somehow the warming becomes uh, less meaningful. I believe this is what you mean by moving from like an admirable act to a respectable act. And I'm just wondering how this is not a problem. Like, do you assume that there are both positive rewards from admirable acts and negative rewards from respectable acts. So you're essentially saying we're moving from a carrot to a stick situation. Yeah, no, this is a brilliant question. You asked basically three questions that the whole paper needs to address. So no, not trivial at all. And very, very good questions. You clearly grasped the entire paper. So um, let me try to take them apart. Uh, first of all, just the clarifying part, we're not actually moving. Sorry, let me go back in the slides. We're not moving from, um, so, Obviously, there is a there is a question, an empirical question on sort of where are we flipping between admirable and uh, just putting up like one of the things where we're sort of flipping from admirable to respectable acts and where's the model act. We're imposed here symmetric distribution, which sort of centers us at 50%. You could have a more skewed distribution and this might be slightly different. But the point is the take up, uh, the take up levels that we're ex having in our experiment are fairly low on it, right? So we're only um, at about 40% 
right? Even in the control group. So we wouldn't necessarily think about this as an action, even in the, um, you know, in the absence of introducing um, increased visibility, these social signaling incentives, where we would think um, we're moving from respectable to admirable acts. We're probably, we are in the domain and also what we're estimating, we are in the domain, and you see this from these social multiplier effects, where, um, uh, we where it is admirable effects uh, acts you know basically where not the majority of people are taking it up for whatever reason you know um, they perceive it too costly so we're not flipping just to be clear that's not what we're trying to show we're just sort of moving sorry I'm flipping through too many slides we're moving up um, we're just moving up on on one of the um, we're just moving up on the U shape if that makes sense we're moving further to the we're moving further to the to the right here. So if then it is a negative externality, right? <laughs> so then, and then to be clear, in, in status quo, right, um, people are assigned to already take up the treatment, right, who are already taking up the deworming treatment in status quo in the control group, the image benefits they would be assigned to is the average type, right? Because there's no visibility. So actually they're benefiting as well from introducing visibility because we're now turning a pooling into a separating equilibrium where people who are taking up deworming treatment can now identify as being part of the higher end of the distribution. Does that make sense? It does. I haven't thought of that. <laughs> yeah. So we're basically, just to be clear, like in, 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 uh, in lack of visibility, you have more of a pooling equilibrium, right? So different types are pulled together. And then really what this incentive does is it, it allows you the separation to basically say, I am in this higher part of the distribution. So people shouldn't suffer um, because of that. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, but it's still, um, there is a caveat to this, which we can't measure right now. Um, there is some visibility. So I just want to be very clear. There is a true point to your question. I mean, there was many true points, but um, there, is, um, there is something about there is already existing visibility. I need to think through this more carefully, Annette. I can't say this from, from top of my head right now. There could be something to that. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm not seeing any hands up. So um, I had a question. Um, so I wondered why you chose to use um, a calendar as like, I guess, kind of like a placebo intervention, because you said people did identify the calendar. And, and it's certainly possible that if enough people got these calendars, even though you didn't have any sort of identifier on them, they would become known as like the calendar you get when you get worming treatment. So why did you not use, say, a consumption good like food or airtime or something? Yeah. So first of all, we needed something that's logistically feasible to give to 200,000 people at different treatment locations. So any consumption item, I mean, there's just practical concerns here working with the government and organization who wants to take this to all people. We, we were thinking about various things. It had to be light, it had to be non-perishable, and it had to be uh, little amounts of money. So airtime was something uh, that we were thinking about, but the logistics of implementing that at that point, when you come for deworming treatment or giving it out or even scratch cards, there were concerns around it. And also the perception was that people would value 50 cents of airtime potentially less than a gift of, let's say, a, a small calendar in terms of how they perceive it as a reward or a thank you for coming for deworming treatment. So the calendar really arose out of the fact that we wanted something that is lightweight, that is non-perishable, that's relatively cheap, that people can have multiple of that they would value uh, in that sense. But also I was concerned, or not concerned, but uh, the nice feature about the calendar I thought then was that self-signaling in some sense is happening through that. So if the concern is that it's primarily self-signaling in the calendar you're gonna put up in your, in your home, so you or immediate family members, if there were information asymmetries there, could see that. So getting more to the social aspect um, through that as well versus self-signaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And um, Kate has her hand up. So thank you. It's, yeah, um, really interesting to see the, the kind of different use of the uh, structural model and the distance concerns in this. So it was a very cool paper. Um, I was just thinking about the kind of policy conclusion right at the end, because you were saying, you know, we could put the centers farther apart and get um, people to walk. And I thought it might be really interesting to think about putting some, like maybe it's overly practical, but some actual cost data in it. Because I understand that what you're doing is uh, uh, you're, you're, you're drawing that conclusion from the fact that the treatment effects from close and far when they're signaling are no longer that different. Um, yeah. But I think it, it's still an important point to know whether uh, this is a cheaper alternative. Um, so, you know, when you add in the cost of doing the, um, 
promotion and that sort of thing to so that people allocate a particular value to the signal um, would this actually end up being cheaper I 100% agree no 100% agree with you and there's a various aspects here also I'm speaking to the externalities and how much we reduce infection rates but yeah I think one interesting thing would be really to simulate this out and kind of check feeding in this additional cost data what would even be the optimal location, for example, and depending on different signaling incentives. And just to add on to this, in terms of policy implication, and this is not where the paper is yet, but I'm hoping to take it, this is really motivated by some of the insights that um, Jean Tirol and Roland Bonnebo have put forward in their Laws and Norms paper, which is more, I would say, I don't want to say practical, but a little bit more than the 2006 paper, is saying that actually when these social image concerns are at play, we really have to carefully think about how we're using tax and subsidies and kind of modify how we think about Pigouvian and Ramsey and taxation, since there are these additional effects that can uh, happen as we're changing, for example, taxes or subsidies, meaning prices or the cost, that also these reputational returns can change. So there's an additional cost, there's an additional tax or additional rent someone could capture as you are playing around with price instruments in order to enforce uh, public good contribution. Uh, um, uh, contribution. So in terms of when we're thinking about how to think about social welfare, uh, these instruments, these non-price instruments in the context of social things are not currently part of the equation. I think it's broadly sort of, oh yeah, this is fun, which is great signaling, it's kind of easy, it doesn't cost money and you know it's easy, a sticker or something, but there's more to thinking about that, I think, not only thinking about how these vary, but then also the interaction with price instruments. So it's not quite there yet, but this is where I'm hoping to take it more in terms of the emphasis, not just another signaling paper, but that we can learn from that. Sorry, Emma, do we have time for another question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, hi, Anne. A really hey. interesting kind of uh, project. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't quite understood the whole thing as, as well as Annette has, but I, I do have a question, especially now uh, following up on Kate's question, where uh, you were talking more about the, 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 the spatial component or the cost that's kind of uh, decreasing over, over time, uh, over distance, obviously. Even if we abstract away from the signaling component, it seems that you have enough data that you could move beyond just the far kind of close kind of dictonomy. Oh, and we're using that. Oh, are you using oh I'm that? so sorry. I Again, have missed it. Mea culpa. So basically, in the reduced form, we're only using the random assignment of far and close. In the structural model, we're using distance continuously. And that's also the only way that I could basically show you these results here which is basically, uh, and we're using the, the continuous distance data, which you see on the x-axis, every observation we actually have for the communities we're using that. And the reason why we could use that, so it's trying to be explained at the beginning is, it's really random whether you were far and close. We can right. correctly show this in estimation, but I just wanted to give you an image that shows you that, which is basically the location of these primary schools with the GPS data we plot. It's like all over the place. Okay, so okay. that's why we can, even though we weren't like able to assign you randomly to 1.2 versus 1.8, you know, we were doing far and close, we can exploit the full spectrum, the, co the continuous variable of distance. Right. Okay. Because I, I think... Uh, this and is, otherwise this we couldn't cool. do the derivative, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're doing yeah. the derivative. I was, I, mean, <laughs> I was wondering, I was just like, are you then doing no, 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 no. like, <laughs> something that's linear and then superimpose that on the... Okay, fine. Makes no, 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 no. We can talk later about this. Super cool. Thing. Yeah, no, no. We're not imposing anything here. We're actually using the data... Um, that we're observing continuously across uh, 0 to 2.5 kilometers. But as you see, that's why I'm plotting it on the x-axis. We have thinner data at some point, so certain estimates, but you also see it basically sort of in the, you know, in, as they're fanning out or how precise they're estimated. At some point, we're having less data. I just sort of plotted that, um, how precise the estimates are. Great, so I think we're just out of time now. So thank you so much, Anne, for your presentation and, and for fitting so much in in, in the time. I, I think everyone's really enjoyed it. So, so thank you so much for-, for Thank you so much for having me today. Thank <laughs> um, you so and thank much. you very much to the audience uh, for, for joining us.